My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I've spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. Guys, welcome to the show tonight. Back to the DTD Podcast. So I have a question for you. What do you get when you cross a professional baseball player, an MMA fighter, a special forces soldier, and a coffee CEO and kind of connoisseur. Well, you get Patrick Collins, and we've got him on the show tonight from Delta Fuego. Pat, welcome to the show. DJ, thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah, man. It. So, you know, I introduce you as all those things. So you've got to kind of walk us through that because there's so many different things that we have there. I, and, and I don't think they could be, other than maybe the baseball player and the MMA fighter, I don't think they could be different further away from each other. So let's start with professional baseball and kind of how you got there and, and how that turned out for you. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I played baseball growing up my whole life. Uh, came from a baseball family. My, um, you know, my grandfather had played in college, you know, started, uh, the first baseball team up at the Merchant Marine Academy in New York. Um, there, my uncle went on to play pro ball for Kansas city Royals. Then my brother was drafted out of high school. Uh, I followed along with him, drafted out of high school um, by the Braves. From there, I decided to go to Clemson University. Um, went down to Clemson. The intent was to, to play baseball and then, uh, you know, play football as well. Um, I was highly recruited as a, as a football um, uh, player as well throughout uh, high school, more than, more than baseball probably. And then um, transferred to St. John's University back to New York City. Um, got into a little off off the field, extracurricular activities, um, could it keep my hands, you know, in my pocket kind of deal. Um, and, uh, when I'm going back to New York to, a, a close friend of mine actually played with my uncle in college up at Seton Hall back in the seventies. And he was the head coach guy, Ed Blankmeyer and, um, given the opportunity to play there. I, I threw the ball pretty well up in Cape Cod league and got drafted uh, fifth round pick by the Montreal Expos, um, in 1999. So I, I played with them for about, I think about four years with the Expos and I got traded to the Cardinals organization uh, right around the double A when I was up in double A, double A, triple A kind of, uh, you know, about to crack. I, I thought at the time with the Expos cracked to the big leagues and they had a major league baseball had their fire sale, you know, and they just they had their pick of everybody. We just all got traded to a different organization. And so my, my dreams of big league uh, ball was uh, cut short a little bit. You know, I, I joke about it with everybody because, you know, what happened, you know, to get hurt, this and that. I always tell them, you know, I, I, I didn't know there's this thing called the strike zone, you know. Um, I just I just didn't know you had to throw strikes. So, <laughs> you know, I threw the ball hard. Um, I hit a lot of guys and, you know, um, I think control issues became a little bit part of it. But at the end of the day, was, you know, sometimes it's it's right place, right time, right organization. And also, you know, I got to tip my hat to all those guys it's 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 a great level that they're at it's it's the consistency and I think that's just something I lacked you know I, I don't think I lacked the talent I think just the the consistency of, of where uh you know day in day out in in the role being either a starter or a reliever kind of deal um I was always going back and forth so I never really found that comfort zone and uh after about I think six or seven years my uh my professional baseball career came to an end and uh it was it was time to sort of grow up <laughs> and, you know, I, I avoided that. I'm still avoiding that today. When you talk about consistency, do you think it was because you were so recruited in high school for football, baseball, things like that? Do you think that lack of consistency was lack of motivation or w- what do you think brought that lack of consistency or what, what I guess what brought it to the forefront? I think, you know, at, at times I had flashes of uh, consistency where I was, uh, you know, I think maybe at times too, maybe I got bored, you know, just because in baseball, it's a little more boring than hey, having that, that high speed completely right. all the time. You know, when I, I flourished a little bit more and I, I, I thrived a little better in the bullpen and the closer and setup role because I, I knew I'd be involved in the game almost every night. So I think that was as opposed to a starter where I'd, I'd be one day on five days off. And, you know, uh, that, that idle time is, you know, that's, it's not a good thing for, for a person who's, 
whose brain is scrambled in a thousand different directions at all times, you know? So I think that, uh, that, that pace of what it was uh, sometimes to me was a little bit boring. And I think I, I needed that structure and I needed that, uh, that consistency, you know, of being on the field every day, being, being have to be, you know, part of that team or part of the result of the outcome. I think I thrived more in the, in the role of, as a closer. And I had my, my best numbers probably in that role um, than I did in, in the other roles where I was, you know, as a starter. And so did you ever look back at, at football? Cause you, you know, you wanted to play football for Clemson and baseball for Clemson. Did you ever look at that and maybe not necessarily like an NFL career or anything like that, maybe a, an arena football league or did that ever cross your mind or was it just the baseball? And then once you got into the baseball after, I mean, that's not a short career. Seven years is not a short time to play. No, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it was always like I always had the football mindset. I think I think more than anything else, and I was recruited as a linebacker, defensive end, um, and I think I always had that mindset where I wanted to play football. Um, my brother actually did the same. He he played Pro Bowl out of high school, went back to Division three college, played uh, played football uh, for D three, wound up you know breaking all these records at Montclair State University, small uh, small D three school. Went up uh, again, signed as a free agent with the Giants, and then he went over to NFL Europe, played in Europe for a little bit. Um, and I, I thought maybe they're on that same path. I mean, we joked about it even when I was playing, like, hey, you know, uh, I just got done. I think he was overlapping where he was still playing college ball at like 26 years old. You know, it was like a 26 year old freshman, I think. Uh, and uh, say, come on, come on back. I said, you know, I'll. I'll come in on third downs, you know, and rush the quarterback as long as I can smoke a cigarette on the sidelines, you know. Um, <laughs> that was that was sort of like, yeah, I was always joking with the coaches that I would do that. But um, but I always missed it. You know, I, I think I always had that football mindset. Um, we came from a, a strong football upbringing in uh, Union, New Jersey, was was one of the powerhouses, uh, 80s, 90s. Uh, we were number three in the country, you know, for numerous times, USA Today. We had a great uh, – Great high school coach. It played under Vince Lombardi, you know, like tough, uh, tough Italian guy, you know, out of Jersey City, New Jersey. He, um, you know, my senior year, he actually lost a battle of cancer. He had stomach cancer and he was like a father to myself and my brother for, for, you know, for as long as we remember. And he, uh, he passed my, my senior year, but he was, he was like the, the epitome of, of grit, I think. And, and, and just that strength, you know, a little bit more of that, that old school that you don't, you don't see as much anymore, you mm -hmm. know, sort of, uh, you know, putting forearms in the back of guys necks kind of deal and, you know, getting underneath guys chin straps. He, he sort of taught us a little bit of the dirty football, but it was also like that, you know, straight ahead, you know, Hey, you're, you're probably gonna run the ball about, you know, 80 times today and you're going to throw maybe, maybe twice was a luxury if we threw the ball twice in a game. So um, it was, it was more of that, you know, straight up and down blue collar mentality. And I think that's uh that's one of the things I missed. And I, I, I really, I really wish I did explore the football Avenue. Um, Prior to baseball, I think I probably would have had a longer career path with football. I think that was more of my mindset. And, uh, you know, I still love watching it today. <clears throat> well, you're not a small guy. What were your, uh, what were your stats when you were that, that level of college going into college? And when you played baseball, what were your stats? I mean, I'm about six, four. I think I shrunk about an inch and a half, uh, since, you know, getting in the army. Um, but I'm six, four. Right now, I'm probably about 260, 60, 65 pounds. Um, but I was uh, in high school, like my senior year, I was probably about 235, 6'4", 235, um, around that, you know. Um, so I, I could run pretty well. You know, I ran I mean, like anywhere from a legit 4'7", you know, on, on, on the ground. Um, so I was recruited as a tight end, defensive end. Uh, some places even like, you know, uh, linebacker they had me some places they just wanted to basically you know maybe fill me out kind of deal Notre Dame I offered Notre Dame um I was I was set on actually going there just for football I wouldn't have played baseball if I did I think I would have given up baseball but uh I, I had a lot of offers to do dual sports at different universities I just uh I chose baseball at Clemson just at the time they were they were number one uh ranked team they were a powerhouse and they had a great pitching staff great pitching coach at the time uh the guy John Pulowski and um they, they had a, a great recruiter now today, a guy, Tim Corbin, who's over at Vanderbilt now. He's the head coach there. He's had great success, but he was our recruiting coordinator at the time, assistant coach. And I mean, great guy. And I mean, he's, he's produced 
great talent over at Vanderbilt national championships the last few years. And I think they're number one in the country right now, but, um, but yeah, so I was, I was always a big kid, you know, I was lanky in the beginning, but then, you know, when I filled out and came into my own, I think, um, you know, I was always an athlete, you know, uh, even playing baseball, I think just for my size, I was able to move around pretty well. You talk about your brother a lot. Now you guys are Irish twins, right? We are. Okay. We are. We're a year and, Oh, about a year, year apart, a little more than a year apart. Um, but he was, uh, two grades above me, August baby. I'm a March baby. And, uh, he was, so when he got drafted out of high school, my parents had to sign the permission slip because he was only 17 years old, you know? And, uh, so he had a, they had to sell their kid to the, uh, to the brewers at the time. So we didn't have the greatest luck. We got, we got drafted by the Expos and the Brewers. So not the, not the two shining, uh, <laughs> shining lights of uh, organizations but hey we're, we're blessed either way to play pro ball you know so you, you talk about your brother a lot and you guys kind of had a sibling rivalry nothing nothing bad but i've i've watched interviews where you talk about uh you guys fought back and forth a lot there was a real competitive yeah. spirit between the two of you with your parents uh was it a good uh upbringing like always had your parents around back and you all that kind of stuff yeah, uh, they were always supportive. Um, pretty strict. My father was a uh, my father was a was a police officer, I think, for uh, 15 years, and then he went over to the fire department for another uh, 18 years. Um, so we came from uh, that same upbringing, Irish Catholic upbringing. Um, my pretty strict. My my father, my uncle, all my uncles, all law enforcement, um, fire department. My grandfather, my brother now is a is a firefighter as well. Um, but yeah, so that was sort of the, the the atmosphere we were always brought up around. So it was it was a big family thing, you know. Extended family was always, you know, going to you know your PBA events, your, your cops, your firemen, picnics, etc. So all those kids and uh, our cousins, etc., from either if they're half from an NYPD or there's some of them still work in uh, in Jersey right now. But uh, that was sort of sort of the upbringing. So yeah, it was it was. I mean, for us, it was great. That's all we knew. So uh, right, yeah, right. Really yeah. And so. You, you do this, you are going, from the way I understand it, you're going back and forth uh, between kind of professional baseball, finishing your degree, and you go to Hawaii um, to finish up your yeah. degree. And to, I, I guess, also, were you playing baseball over there or were you just trying to finish your degree in Hawaii? Uh, well, yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> I was finishing my degree, but I was also, I think I was still in the last year or two of my um, playing ball. So I just went out there for the off season. My, my now ex-wife was uh, going out there. She matched for, uh, for, um, for her master's degree out there at Argosy university in Hawaii. So went out there sort of uh, spent the off season out there, um, got done playing ball. And then I started, um, was going back to finish school. In the meantime, I got introduced to a friend of mine while I was bartending, actually. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, just happenstance, great, great connection. Uh, guy Kaleo Y that runs uh, Papa Kaleo Jiu Jitsu. He's a uh, black belt under uh, Helsing Gracie, one of the first black belts under him. And um, he uh, introduced me to Jiu Jitsu. And, you know, I, I started rolling out there with him. And they had a great school. It was free. You know, I was doing probably two, three nights a week at least. And right under there, they had a, up in the pop play, the Hawaiian homestead. So I was the only, I was the only Howley guy that was up there. You know, it was just weird Man, when I, I would come up to that the in a long like time. The, I was stationed in Hawaii. Four. So I haven't yeah. heard, I haven't heard someone <laughs> call themselves a Howley in a long time. Yeah. So the, the six foot four Howley guy that would come up all the time, they walk up there, you know, I, 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 they, it was great though. Cause they took me in as one of their own, you know, as part of the family still today, I go back there. Um, I fought for him in MMA. My first fight was out there in the Blaisdell Center. And um, it's great because they announced, you know, Team Papa Kalea. And they're like, Patrick Collins? <laughs> they're waiting for like some <laughs> long Hawaiian name. And they're like, who's this guy? You know? Um, I don't think he's from Hawaii <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, it was great. It was, uh, it was an experience. I still stay in touch. You know, when I go back to Hawaii, I, I, I touch base with them. I still stay in contact with them all the time. And, uh, you know, it, it was a great relationship. And it's, it's, it's something I cherish and it was, it was my foundation, I think for MMA and for, uh, for jujitsu. So, I mean, I was blessed to, to cross paths with them. Well, you know, when I was stationed over there, I was stationed with the 25th over there. And, um, sure. you, you talk about Gracie, that was a, that was a huge name over there. And 
and they were kind of at the forefront of MMA and and uh, Cage and UFC and all that kind of stuff. They were, they were. I mean, so that's a great group to fall in with right off the bat. Uh, they were widely respected all over there, and and for a long time, that was pretty much the only name you heard in that. Yeah, I uh, you know I had the I had the privilege and honor of uh, training with Hoist recently. Hoist was the first UFC uh, champion. And uh, I trained with him actually down in Guatemala and super pro law enforcement guy. Um, he was telling me about that. I, I think they got a little bit of a, maybe there's a hiccup down in New Mexico where they're giving everybody like these uh, sheriff's badges and all this stuff a little while. But I've heard uh, about that. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you can see, yeah, whatever it was. So, it, um, you know, not a fault of his, but they were all, he's super pro law enforcement, pro military. You know, we're able to talk a lot about stuff. Um, I trained with, you know, with his brother, with Helson, was the first guy I trained with. Um, and then uh, I trained with uh, I trained with him. I trained with Henzo up in New York City. And I had, I had the privilege of, of training with that family and even the branches off of their family. Um, so it, to me, it was it was luck that I was able to be exposed to that, you know, so so close to the tree kind of to, per se. Um, and they are. They're great people, great family. And, and basically they are. They're 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 the. Uh, you know, the forefathers of what jujitsu is now today. And I think what MMA is and, and UFC, you know, they, they started that whole thing with the family. It was sort of to display their skill set, you know, the family skill set. And, and Hoist wasn't the strongest of all of them. And that's why they put him forward, you know, to, to show that, hey, we're not putting our number one forward. We're just showing that, hey, we, this still, this art will dominate, you know, against whoever. So it was great. And great people um, still stay connected with, with a lot of them. And, uh, you know, it was an honor and still is an honor to, uh, to have, uh, trained under these guys. Yeah. Uh, over in Hawaii, where, where were you living at when you were in Hawaii training? Uh, I lived right up the street. I lived in, uh, it was called the executive center right on, uh, right on Bishop and, uh, right down the street from Aloha towers. Oh, right downtown. I, I lived in a low, uh, I lived in Pearl city. Uh, okay. in, in the twin towers right outside that overlook yep. like Pearl Harbor, things like that. Yep. Um, yep. you lived in a, in a pretty nice area over there. Uh, it wasn't that bad. I mean, you go like back <laughs> on hotel street, you know, hotel <laughs> street's a little, uh, it could, there's some bum fights going on back there. there there's you know? definitely <laughs> that. There's definitely that. Uh, there's, there's some other stuff too. There's some shady stuff that goes on. Oh. I used to bartend down at, um, uh, O'Toole's. And next to Murphy's, if you're familiar with that is, uh, it's right across the street. I'm trying and, to think uh, of the one that we always went to. Uh, there's a uh, Moose McGillicuddy's. So Moose's, I worked across the street at Kelly O'Neill's. Was okay. across from Moose's. Okay. Moose, Moose's just burned down. Oh, really? Just burned down. Yeah, I was down in Hawaii and I was like, oh man, they had a fire. It just burned down. They shut the door. Well, coincidentally, you know, or not, uh, they shut the doors because they went out of business because of COVID, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of bars out there did, unfortunately. Right. And uh, within about another week or two, it somehow it, it set fire, you know, <laughs> it combusted. So, I mean, you know, well, that's been there for at least, it, knows. <laughs> you know, that's got to have been there for at least 25 years. Yeah. It was a staple down there. It's a yeah. shame, but uh, yeah, it was, it was always, Anything you very pro military bar. Yeah. Anything you missed down there? Uh food or any of the the nightlife or anything like that from Hawaii? I think I just missed like the I to me, like some people have like maybe a different I think like that Aloha spirit, like the way people are with you, I think bring you into their homes kind of deal and open doors. I think I missed that. Uh, I'm privileged enough to go back and you know, I spent some time in Kauai now with work and uh I went back to Oahu for some training. I go back from time to time. So, I, I mean, I do miss the food. I miss sort of uh, the laid back, you know, Aloha kind of uh, spirit. I, I also miss a little bit of, uh, you know, if someone's got a problem, they let them scrap. You know, they, they go at it. They Afterwards, they, you know, no harm, no foul. Nobody's nobody's pulling a gun out. Nobody's stabbing somebody. Hey, you, you got your lickings in. You're good. And they, they walk. They go on their way. You know, that's sort of it's like an old West kind of, uh, you know, mentality. So it's, maybe that's a little bit of something we lack nowadays. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's the greatest way, but Hey, sometimes, you know, things can't be resolved. They get resolved that way. And guys pick themselves up and they, they walk off, they shake their hands and they're good to go. So I miss a little bit of that. 
so when you say we're missing a little bit of that, can you can you go a little more into that with with today's society? What what is it exactly that we're missing? I, I think we're not allowing people to to you know to test themselves a little bit. I, I think you know to get to that position of of uncomfortability. Like we're we're so we're so scared to be in an uncomfortable situation. You know whether whether it's a whether it's having that conversation with somebody about something, maybe it's an uncomfortable topic or, you know, everything gets one-sided or it gets so censored to a point where we can't touch that subject. It's too touchy of a subject to talk about. It's, uh, you know, let's not, let's not explore that because we may hurt somebody's feelings. We're so worried about everybody's feelings being hurt and, and, and appeasing everybody. You know, it's, it's, there's no such thing as a, you know, utopian society. It's never going to happen. You know, someone's going to get offended. You're going to go work for a guy that you don't like probably most of your life you're going to get not get along with everybody you work with you know, that's that's part of life but every, everybody i think today wants to everybody gets a trophy you know mentality um everybody's good you're just as good as everybody else everybody you know it's not it's not reality you know and i, I think i think we got away from a little bit of the competition where hey it, it's okay to fail you know fail forward you know like go out there don't be scared or intimidated to take a chance you know you're gonna fail you know like I think that the the best thing with baseball to me was, hey, it's a game of failure. You know, you could be you'd have your greatest stuff one day as a pitcher, and you know, you, you break three or four bats, and all of a sudden, you know, there's still base hits. You know, you broke the bat, you, you made the pitch, they're base hits. The guy, you know, kicks the ball, throws it away, and now you just give up three runs and you lose a game. I mean, you could have your best stuff. It doesn't life doesn't always go the way you plan it. You know, you know, it's the it's the old thing is you know. Uh, you want to make God laugh, you know, tell him your plans, you know, it's, he, he, he don't, he don't care. You know, he's got his own agenda. And, and, you know, if that's what you believe is, is you gotta, you gotta be able to deal with what comes down the pipe. And I think sometimes we're so, we're so preventive where we, we want to not expose maybe our kids and expose ourselves to that uncomfortability uh, and be in an uncomfortable situation where we, we fear to try to, you know, push those limits to, to get to that, uh, you know, to get to that point. Um, you know, what, back in the day, it was, you know, if you had a disagreement and kids, a couple of kids had a had a fist fight or, you know, a tussle in a, in a schoolyard. All right. That was it. You know, you, you scraped each other off and you wind up being best friends. You know, um, it, it doesn't happen anymore. People get so involved and, you know, it, it becomes such a, uh, you know, we're walking on eggshells around each other. And I think, you know, we need to we need to let that guard down a little bit and let, let uh, you know, let especially with kids, let kids be kids. And then when you're growing up, Hey, make mistakes, you know, don't be scared to make mistakes going forward. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it's the one way you're going to find out, you know, test yourself really what you're made of, you know, for me, it was, it was testing myself, you know, going through selection, going through, you know, the, the Q course for me was, Hey, there's, there's limits that I think I thought my body could take and I thought my mind could take, but I never pushed them. And then when I actually pushed it, to the limits, I understood I could always go a lot further than I was capable of. I think we lack that. I think we lack that as a society because maybe years ago, you know, our grandfathers and everybody else, everybody had to serve, you know, um, whether it was, you know, they were drafted into the army, they're drafted into the service, you know, came from a generation of maybe the generation before you had that service, you know, um, or you had, you know, like yourselves and, and like, you know, my family, you know, the law enforcement, so you had that, that sense of service. But that's that's a small minority, especially today. You know, it's it's not like, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, there was there was a light that was shined on and everybody was like, you know, they were put on a pedestal as far as law enforcement and society as a whole, whether the media, whoever portrays it has has shined a bad light on it, you know, and it, it's gone to the point where. You know, I grew up where these guys are my heroes and my uncle was my hero. He looked at cops in New York and all this stuff. Is that's who you want to be? You know, he grew up at like copper fireman, you know? Um, no, and, go and ahead. I think, we, I think we got away from that a little bit, you know? Well, what I wanted to say from it, and, and it made me think of this when you just said that when we grew up as we had those heroes in front of us. But I think you would agree that a lot has changed, not just necessarily police and fire or uh, military, but in general, um, those jobs are, are just not looked upon anymore. So therefore sometimes you have to lower standards and you get into a vicious cycle. And, and I'm talking about a, a multitude of different first responders and stuff, but 
you you get into this vicious cycle where you lower the standards uh you may get some bad apples in military fire everything like that and then it's shined on and it's looked down upon and then you lower your standards again i don't know really and i've asked a lot of people that have been on the show and stuff i don't know and maybe you do is there a way out of this at any point? I've always thought, you know, from being in the military that it'll swing back. The pendulum will swing back sooner or later. Yeah. It's all cyclical, but right now I really don't see an end in sight for any of it. Yeah. You always say, you know, it'll self-correct itself, you know, or it'll come back and, or people will deselect themselves, you know, is always the thing or, Hey, you know, people get selected, but they'll, they'll deselect themselves throughout the, the course. Right. I don't know what the answer is to it. I, I think there has to be, you know, a line in the sand where it gets drawn, you know, and I could say stuff with, you know, with SF, I think, you know, because the numbers are down at a point, I think the standards have been lowered a little bit, that the course has been shortened to where it was before, you know, it was a, a two-year pipeline, basically as a Delta, you, you would have to go through a two-year pipeline almost if any other MOS was, about the same, you know, considering if you recycled, et cetera, it was about a year and a half. It's now down to a course of six months, you know, and, and six months is not enough time to determine, you know, whether a guy's a turd or not a turd. And if you don't have a standard, a standard's a standard. Um, and, and it's hard to say, you know, well, the standards are, you know, you could, you could bend them this way or that way. I thought that at times too, until, you know, I came face to face with it. You know, I, I got through the whole Q course, um, and at the very end, you know, I, I, uh, I tore my calf, I tore my calf at a 90% tear in my gastroc. Um, and I kept running on it. You know, I just like, Hey, I'm at the end. I'm not going to let this, you know, this slow me down. And I, I had the injury for a while. Um, I, I, I passed my five mile. I went to take the PT test and it blew out about probably a half mile in. I missed the final PT test by two seconds. I missed the standard by two seconds. Uh, and, you know, I went to the board, everything else. I appealed and said, hey, I'm hurt. But I said, hey, standards are standard. I sat out for a year. I sat out for a year recovering. Went out. I was fortunate enough to go out to McCall as an instructor and, and do the medical coverage. Um, and uh, it was great to be around those guys. You know, it got me back involved. Jiu-Jitsu actually came full circle where I was rolling with the uh, sergeant major and the, the lieutenant colonel out there that, that ran uh, McCall. They got me back in the course. I ran a five mile and I went on my way, but, but I didn't lower the standard. You know, I could have said, Hey, two seconds is two seconds. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I did try to do that. You know, I did try to say, Hey, two seconds is two seconds. You know, I'm hurt blah, blah, blah. on my best day. I've passed this a thousand times, but, uh, but that's the standard. So again, the standard is a standard. And I, and I, I have more respect for it now knowing that I went through that and I came back and I, I wound up going back and completing the mission to get what I wanted and to get what I fought for and to get what I earned. You know, I think I earned it. I felt more that I earned it that way than I would have if someone just said, Hey, you know, nominus, dominus, here's your two seconds, you know, go on your way. Here's your green beret. Um, so I think it, I earned it more that way. And I think that that today they need to uphold a standard is a standard. And as much as I don't want to be a tab protector and, you know, I'm, I'm not that guy. Um, I think they, they need to extend that course back. And I think in general, like even if it's law enforcement or, or whatever it may be, you know, you make your mistakes in training so that when you go out to the streets, you don't have these incidents. And I think if you can increase the training on the front end, and you have that inoculation, you, 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 you get those guys inundated under stress and you increase the stress and the training and make it more realistic, then you're going to have that, that success in the streets more so. But when you, when you, when you make everything, so you lower the standard and a make sure we cookie cut all this stuff and we cut out this stuff because we don't want to stress people out too much, you know, give them their red cards, or their stress cards, if they feel like they're, they're not getting through training, you know, what happens when we get on the street now you're all you're alone at four o'clock in the morning three o'clock in the morning by yourself you know and, and backups nowhere to be found it, it's it's not fair you know it, it, and any man a guy my size is going to be scared in the middle of the night especially if i'm not if i'm not used to that stress and i don't have experience in that stress you know it's a stressful situation so i think one way we can alleviate some of that is go back to you know um you know bleeding training not in combat you know that's what should happen you know and if we, we stress more of that training and stress more of that training cycle prior to putting people out on the street, 
you know, who maybe, you know, fired, you know, one magazine while they're in the academy, that doesn't, that's not going to make you proficient with your handgun, you know, and, and we're going to say budget cuts and all this other stuff. Well, at the end of it, you know, the budget's going to be, it's going to be a lot higher at the end when you have a lot of civil lawsuits because you got, you know, that killing or whatever happens, you know, so, so I think you, you invest in the training on the front end and you see results in the back end. Did you ever see that? And without using, of course, names and stuff, did you ever see that where someone may have slipped through the pipeline and then gets over uh, on deployment with you and where guys are just kind of like, what, what the hell's going on here? Did you, did you ever see something like that? Uh, yeah, I saw it more so on the way out. Um, I did. And I think <clears throat> what we had when we came in was, uh, which was great. And they, they took it away. We had green platoon, which is when you came in, you had your own like uh, OTC for, for guys that came in. It didn't matter if you had experience, no experience. You went in and you did, I think it was six or eight weeks of, uh, I mean, we shot till your, your hands were blistered to the point where I don't want to shoot anymore. You know, it was a cephalic, you know, uh, flat range movement, uh, stress fire, et cetera. Like you shot, you shot, you shot, you shot, you shot to the point where like hey, you were, you were burning through your barrels. And, uh, you know, I would say at least 500 rounds a day, probably on, on pistol. Um, if, if not more then you're saying the same thing with rifle to the point where as a green beret, I was like, all right, I don't want to shoot anymore. You know, other guys are like, all right, are we done? You know, kind of like, but we needed that, you know? So when we did get to the team, our SOPs were sort of all the same. When we did get to our ODA, obviously things change a little bit, but, uh, but you weren't, you weren't as fresh as you were if you came off and you had no experience. It was, it was an injustice to some of these guys when they took that away and they're like, Hey, here you go. You showed up day one and it happens. You're getting deployed, you know, and uh, you know, on the job training, man. And we're going to take you out to the range every day to shoot, or you're going to get your dope. You're going to get live dope, you know, once we get out to, to the real world. Um, but I did see a little bit, I, I, I saw it when I was getting out, I think with, maybe more of the character that probably would have been uh, detected uh, prior to, I think, but I, I think each team has its own way of uh, self-correcting, you know, um, and, and we did a great job on my team at least. And, uh, you know, keeping everything inside the team room, like it, we like it, the things get outside of our team room down the hallway. We squashed it at that level. And I think we did a really good job of it. My leadership did a really good job of it. Um, and our NCOs did a really, really good job of it. So, uh, and, you know, special forces, special problems, I think is one of the things we always say, you know, especially in seventh group, it was like, you know, Hey, you screwed up this week. Like, Hey, give it a couple days. Someone's going to screw up worse. You know, <laughs> So it's always like, just, just take that tactical breath and, uh, you know, just try to keep it at the lowest level. And again, you know, I think the biggest thing, that I saw was accountability. Um, if you didn't have that, I think if you were the guy that came in and lied, you know, all we're asking is like, Hey, you don't have to be the best at anything. We're going to get you there. We're going to make you sharper and everything. Everybody's going to sharpen each other, you know, you know, iron sharpens iron kind of deal. Um, but don't lie, you know, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal those three things. If you could do that, you know, you're going to be okay. You know, you're going to be okay in the teams. You're going to stick around for a long time. Uh, but if you break one of those three rules kind of deal and, and nothing gets better with time, right? If you can't come forward and admit you, you suck at something or admit your weaknesses or admit you screwed up and you're going to hide it from your brothers, um, you know, that, that sort of gets your shit kicked in the hallway. When you say that, when hide it, you, you really can't in that kind of job, though. I mean, that's going to get detected. It, it, I mean, real recognizes real. I, I hate to use that yeah. term, but... I don't think that there's a way you can hide that kind of stuff because you're so spotlighted every day. It's a show me kind of place where you either put up, yeah. shut up or get out, you know? And so when, when you see that and you see people like that, um, where do you think, and it's probably the answer that you already gave, where do you think that failure comes in? Is it in the very beginning is it because they've shortened it? it? Where is that breakdown where people are getting across? I mean, everybody slips by. I think that's 
it happens. And then sometimes guys do slip by, but they self-correct themselves, you know? Um, and, and it also, I think that's the credit to the team and the kind of team you are is if you, if you do get a turd and you can't turn, I mean, that's our job, right? Force multiply. You go overseas and you're dealing with guys that they don't have motivation. They don't want to be there. You know, they're, they're forced to be there. They're, they're, they're conscripts. Some of these guys, you know, if you can't do that with an American guy and turn that guy around, I mean, that, that should be your plan. Right. And, uh, we did a good job of it with guys that maybe came in as, as weaker guys, you know, um, maybe I was the weaker guy and, and they, they, they plussed me up and on the things I was weak at, you know, but I was able to at least identify weaknesses. I think the other guys come in, they identify the weaknesses at least in that community. Um, but the shortcomings I think come, I think your, their hands are tied a little bit because the numbers are so down because I think as, as in general, they're just not getting the numbers that want to be in the military anymore. You know, um, they're not getting that, uh, hey, I want to I want to be in the combat arms kind of kind of thing anymore either. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's it, it's the training side. That early on, I think that they're sort of hands tied. Like, hey, we got to push these guys through, and then once we push them through, I think the the mindset is, hey, if we get these guys through, and they could sort of you know they have a baseline of like competency, then these guys are going to turn them you know turn that turd into a diamond, you know, and it does take a lot more time to invest in that. Whereas it used to be like, Hey, you got there. Some of these guys already cut their teeth in Ranger battalion. They grew up there. They came over and it's like, all right, you're, you're already getting something that's pretty refined and you've got a solid NCO that's going to come in as a junior, but he has more knowledge than a senior. Um, and you probably still get that. I mean, you do get that, especially guys coming out of Ranger battalion or coming from, you know, uh, big army infantry guys coming before from either 25th, 82nd, et cetera, you know, hundred first guys. Um, it's, it's just, I think, uh, you don't get to see in the front end, I think in the, in the training pipeline, cause it's not as long. So it doesn't give these guys enough eyes on consistently have eyes on to identify, you know, who's a turd and who's not the turd. And at the end of the day, they don't really have the say to say, Hey, we got to hold this guy back because we don't have the numbers. We have to push him through. So I think at this point, I think the responsibility falls on the teams to, uh, to sharpen these guys up or to identify them like, Hey, this not this guy never gets to go play. You know, he stays he stays in the rear with the gear kind of deal, and we're not going to let him go out and play with us. You would agree, I think that that it's different though. We've been at war right now for twenty plus years, uh, yeah. or twenty years this year. I, I would you know, give or take. It's a different kind of army. Uh, when I was in, I, I, I've said it before. I was never in combat. I was in at that time where there wasn't really anything. Um, going on and I can speak to it from a law enforcement standpoint where out in the streets and where you work and all that kind of stuff. And it's real there. Do you think that we've just reached a level with being at war at 20 years where you say no one wants to go in the military? No one wants to really be a police officer. Have we reached a level of burnout? I, I think to, I think to an extent, probably in the last 10 years, I think you reached a level of burnout in the, in the special operations community. I think just because of how extended they were in a lot of these operations, you know, the, it was supposed to be, you know, one to 1.5 back home. Like you're gone for six months, you're home for a year. You're never really home. You're always on a training, you're going somewhere else, a J set, et cetera. So th there's definitely burnouts. I mean, the biggest casualty is usually your family. Um, those relationships, uh, it's hard to it's hard to maintain that level and sustain that, especially if you're in a combat situation. And, and I mean, as we're talking right now, there's guys doing combat operations in Afghanistan. You know, they're 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 out at night. They're they're doing stuff. They're still going after the bad guys. You know, while everybody thinks that war's been over for the last ten years, it's it's still going on. I mean, eighteen nineteen, we it was probably the most kinetic operations we had. For six months, we went over there and, and annihilated ISIS. In, in six months, we took a battalion over there. Um, but the rest of the world didn't know that was going on, you know, for the most part. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I think there's a level of burnout. But, you know, I was just talking to a friend of mine, too, who's uh, he's actually a 25th ID helicopter pilot who was stationed out in Hawaii um, a while back. And he, uh, he mentioned, you know what the best part, though, is about America is you can go to any mall, you know, as opposed to these other countries, you go to any mall, you get some kid that still wants to be an 11 Bravo, uh, 11, you know, X-ray, whatever it is. 
you still have that knucklehead that's talking about it. You get over here, that guy talking about it, playing a video game or something else where you go to these other countries, they don't have that motivation. You know, you don't, you don't still have that. So there still are those kids out there that want to do that, you know, they're from all parts of the country. I think it's just, it's a smaller percentage, but there still is that, you know, thank God there's still that warrior culture that still exists out there that, that these kids are going to step up. And, they, and as much as you say, Oh, it's, you know, the, the level has been dropped. There's, there's still those guys that are out there there that is the next generation that as long as there's still warriors that are out there, that are train these guys up to the right standard and, and allowed to, and even if they're not allowed to, they're still going to do it. The NCOs are still going to do it. Whether, you know, leadership says they can or cannot, they're going to do it. They're going to do things their way. You know, it's just the way the army has always been, you know, you, as an NCO, you, you know, you're always giving the middle finger to, to leadership behind their backs and you're going to do things your way because it's, it's an NCO driven military, unlike any other military in the world. You know, that's, yep, that's what makes absolutely. us successful. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned, um, over in Afghanistan when they were the biggest kinetic missions that we've seen, uh, the president said today that he is pulling the troops out of Afghanistan. The war is over over there. It seems like kind of a silly statement to say that we're just pulling all the troops out. War's over. We're all coming home. I, I want to kind of get your thoughts on that because when I heard it, I thought you, you you can't. Why are you telling people that? Because now you're just setting up false hope for people that hey, we're going to be done doing this and we're going to be back. Yeah. That that's not going to happen. And you're giving the enemy the playbook too. You know, you're telling them, hey, all right, hey, you know what? Let's lay low for a couple months. Let's re let's re reconnoiter. Let's get all our stuff. Let's go back across Pakistan, bring our stuff back over. And then, hey, the Americans are going to leave. Um, are we going to take all the Turks and all the other people that helped us these last 20 years with us? Or are we going to leave them to just get slaughtered? Because that's what's going to happen. Um, and the guys that we trained up, the commandos, all these other guys, too, that, you know, were maybe they weren't the, the, the tip of the spear, but they helped us, you know, and they, 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 we build allies with these guys. Are we going to leave those guys and hang those guys out to dry? Uh, I, I don't think that's the answer. Um, I'm not a politician, but I don't think that's the answer. And I think uh, historically we looked at things like, you know, um, in the past when we have pulled out of places without, you know, leaving our foot, our, our, our footprint there, um, it hasn't historically worked out for the, for the people that we left behind. So, um, I don't think that's just going to happen. Um, can it is, it, is it a wise choice? Mm, I mean, do we need to be over there anymore? I'm not sure. Um, but are we going to forfeit all the stuff that we fought for and just give it back and give it away? Uh, I don't think that's the right answer. So do you have, I don't want to say a right answer. Do you have a better answer? I mean, I think it's a process. I think the long game is, you know, as far as, small unit special operations, which is most of the people that are over there right now is, has been, you know, you're, you're out, you're operating outside without minimum support, right? The big army is no longer there. The big military is no longer there. I think breaking things down as they have been over a period of time. Yes. But I think just, Hey, Hey, come Monday morning, you know, we're all out of here. Everybody fend for themselves. You know, there's a lot of stuff we're leaving over there infrastructure wise, a lot of other stuff too, that that's going to be susceptible. And there's a lot of, you know, bad guys and, and boogers that are still over there running around uh, and near peer other countries too. So uh, we don't want them having access to a lot of stuff we leave behind. Um, if we're going to take all this stuff with us, all right, that, that's another story, or we're going to hand it over to these guys. I uh, hope we hand it over to the trusted guys that we have there. Um, and that's few and far between. So, um, it, it's, it's a hard answer. You know, it's, it's a hard one for anybody to make, but I think the long game is that you still have to keep somewhat of a foothold there and you're going to have to keep a couple guys over there, these smaller, you know, special operations teams, um, to sort of go in and do a little bit of extermination, uh, of, of all these, you know, the crickets that come out of the woodwork, you know, so they don't keep, uh, coming back and building up to what ISIS was. Anything that stand out in your mind from over there? Anything that when you think about it, it instantly comes to you? Um, I think just the, the, the smell and stuff from like the helicopters going out on those missions. I think that to me is like, you know, like I, I, I miss that, you know, I miss like the, the actual, like, Hey, 
it's like prepping to go out on a mission. I miss miss getting ready to, you know, to get on the Chinook on the 47s, get out there and hey, it's it's launch time and we're going in the middle of nowhere. Um I miss that. I think some some things are there's just some moments that are weird. I think they're funnier moments, maybe dark humor, where it's like and I miss some of that stuff with, with the team guys, just just making jokes out of, you know, uh a guy getting shot in the head, for for example, like in his helmet, like sitting outside eating, where I'm like you know, and our response is like, yeah, I told you you shouldn't eat outside, you know, kind of like those small little dark humor things, you know, like I miss that. Um, the smell I don't miss. I mean, there's a distinct smell of that, 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 that stank over there uh, that I still have on some of my clothes. When I go in my Contico, I can still smell it. Um, so I don't miss that. I mean, I miss being around the boys uh, and kind of, you know, you go over there, everybody thinks that, oh man, it sucks. It's like, this is what we signed up to do, especially in special operations. Like we, we signed up to go over there and this was like what we want to do. There's no responsibilities. You know, you get fed well, you get to go shoot every day. Um, you got to go on missions, you got the door and doing what you were trained to do. Um, so I miss that. Um, I, I, I miss more than anything. I miss the boys. I mean, just miss, miss being around them and, uh, and prepping for missions and going out there and just being like, Hey, you know, I think sitting under those, sitting under the stars and stuff when you're out there, like, Hey man, uh, some of these places really suck they were at, but when are we going to be here again? You know? Um, and you're at those, you, you go out on a three day mission turns into a six day mission and you're, you're in the middle of, you know, Indian country and you're all alone. And I, I sort of like, I like that part of it. You know, I think the other guys too, like that part of it. And we like that, that kind of autonomy that we had out there. Um, that, you know, we, we, we could fend for ourselves and we know that our leadership had our back. What do you miss other than, I know you say you miss the boys. What is it that you miss about that life? Does that make any sense the way I'm asking that? Yeah, I think, uh, I think a little bit of like the, the pride that we had, like the, uh, I think across the board, even my, my company, I had a great company uh, that came from Charlie company um, and in seventh, seventh group. And we, uh, you know, second battalion, so two, seven, uh, C three, uh, C two, seven um, was awesome. So like, I, I miss those guys even going back to the B team or um, just, just the camaraderie, I think with everybody that, that you knew, Hey, this guy's from so-and-so team. This guy's from so-and-so team. We went to the course with this guy. Um, I think you had a little bit more of a pride and like you had that, it was that quiet professional kind of stuff where we didn't really, you know, beat our chest and stuff in public. Our guys were pretty humble. Um, but you know, you, you knew that you, you had a little bit of an edge over lies because you, you earned some of that stuff. And I think when you're overseas, I think, uh, what I miss is just that, uh, that freedom. I mean, it sounds crazy, but that, that freedom we had over there to, you know, to, to do what we wanted kind of deal, but also like we had a responsibility that, Hey, we, we had this level of responsibility that we were entrusted with, you know, that, um, from, from a guy that, you know, a high school education guy to, to wherever it may be a guy that, you know, West Point grad, we had that responsibility that they gave us a lot of responsibility, um, for kids that were 23 years old, 24 years old, um, and I think when they came back, that, that responsibility that they had, maybe some guys lacked that, you know, um, well, that gets taken away. And we knew what we did. We knew what we did kind of deal. And it was it's hard to explain outside to the civilian world, like, hey, what we did or where we came from or, or those experiences we had, because I think you could tell some of those people that and they look at you like you had three heads or they just don't believe it, you know. Um, so sometimes it's just like, hey. You know, that's something we'll keep to ourselves because it's something that's ours. It's pretty intimate to us. So the I miss that. The reason I asked that uh, about what you miss and not just them, uh, you're wearing a shirt that, that says it. And I want to go to kind of a dark yeah. place for a minute. But let's talk about veteran suicide. And the reason I ask what do you miss over there, not necessarily just the boys. I, I was... I was looking for like uh, a purpose, a mission. That's what you hear a lot of guys say. I miss uh, having a purpose in life. And I couldn't figure right. out what it was when I got back here. And so you're, you're wearing the shirt right now that says veteran suicide. 
that seems to be another problem with this 20 years of war that we've been at uh, in law enforcement, in uh, firefighting and things like that. We're starting to see a rise in all of those. How do we continue with the mission, continue with the purpose and still uh, get those numbers down? Because they're they're getting astronomical now. Yeah, um, I think it does. It, it, it strikes close to home to me. Um, you know, through all this stuff, we went through deployment and uh, one of my good buddies, he uh, is a master sergeant, one of the team sergeants. Um, guy uh, Andrew Marcosano he uh he wound up taking his own life um when he got back seemed like one of those guys that was super squared away you know long career 82nd uh Ranger Battalion SF was going out to work at Ground Branch or whatever agency you know kind of attache as a Green Beret in, in DC came home from having dinner with his uh his old uh, company commander and um right in front of his wife just he took his life um, unfortunately, and went through a lot of stuff. I think through their, their company when I was with the 82nd, I think they lost something like, uh, I mean, like I think two thirds of their, of their, their platoon or two thirds of their, uh, their battalion actually had committed suicide after they're coming back. So it, it's some, some staggering number, but unfortunately, you know, um, you know, Andy did, he, uh, he made that choice and, 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 and it's a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of stuff on his mind, a lot of things he's seen over probably, I think it was like 12 deployments. Um, so it, it wears on you. Um, I think the way forward and I have been an advocate, you know, for the mental health stuff. And I see it with guys on my own team. I've seen it from three or four of them that struggled. Um, I've struggled with stuff on my own self, you know, at times. Um, you get exposed to some of this stuff, you get some blast injuries. I think that releases some of those chemicals of doing some studies as, as the medic and as an 18 Delta, I've, I've done a lot of research and stuff, um, going through the invisible wounds clinic. When I, when I got out the last six months, um, having a teammate that was shot in the head, uh, struggling with some of this stuff, just cognitive stuff, um, other guys with blast injuries. And it's just that repetitiveness that we don't realize we had these injuries and we're going out 72 hours later, you breach one door, hey, concussed, um, you hit an IED, concussed, um, you're shooting 70 rounds from a 50 cal, you know, it's not normal. It's something that's not normal. And you do this day in, day out for so many years or whatever, six month appointment, whatever it may be. It's not normal. You know, you, you come back and you laugh, you say this to doctors and they ask you like, well, how many blasts do you think you were exposed to? And they said in training in general, how many times have you shot something over seven, six, two? And I'm like, all right, I don't know, two, 10, 20,000 times, you know, like, you know, so it's like, so they, they, they want you to, to expose that, but it, like, it's, you can't really tell a lot of these injuries until, until long-term, until you're dead, they can't really open up and look at your brain, you know, like these NFL guys that are shooting themselves in the chest and they're seeing they have the CTE injuries. Um, so, I think the way to is to support is to, to reach out. You know, I think at times when we're in, we don't want to expose ourselves because we don't want to feel weak or we don't want to, uh, I think that stigma is going away. I think guys know at this time it's going away, at least the special operations is, Hey, you know, lean on each other. If you're having a problem, come forward and let's deal with it together instead of, you know, trying to do this on your own. And you, you see the signs, you know, you see the signs of your teammates, you see the signs of your brothers, but you don't see the signs of yourself. You know, you don't see that you're withdrawing. You don't see that you're, you're not talking to people. You, you, you isolate yourself. You know, you're, you're not finding joy in a lot of things you used to, you know, other people see that though. And so you, you have to have that good, um, that network, I think, and, 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 and keep in touch with these guys. But I mean, you have to have the courage too. And that's what it does take. I think it's, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of courage where you can reach out and say, Hey, I need help. You know, before it's too late, I need help because I'm, I'm tearing myself down and I'm tearing everybody else in my family and everybody else around me down because of maybe something I was exposed to. You know, I, I don't want to be weak and say this is the reason, but th there's there's a reason for some of the stuff and what happens and what we bring back. Um, so, again, I think it's just not letting the Valley win, you know, kind of deal and uh, and bringing bringing some. Uh, exposure to it maybe and, and maybe some studies and also just allowing those resources to let guys know that hey you're not alone their families aren't alone and and people tend to struggle and they want to keep things behind closed doors especially in the special operations community like hey we don't want to embarrass the regiment we don't want to embarrass our team kind of deal 
until it's too late, right? And then then everybody's embarrassed. It, it, it's, it's hard to help a guy when it gets to the point of no return. It, it, you don't have to get to that ground zero before someone reaches out and, and helps you. There's there's a lot of help out there through a lot of these organizations that are willing to help you. Um, and it's just having that that courage, I think, to, to reach out and, and, and finding that network um, to to talk about the stuff that you went through, you know, to, to reach out when, when things aren't going right or you feel down, like, Hey, you know, it doesn't make you a pussy to reach out and call somebody, you know? And so I've made it a point of calling a couple of the guys on my team every Sunday, like, Hey man, let's connect. If I don't hear from you Sunday, like that to me tells me there's something wrong. Right. So we, we've made it a point of reaching out to each other. And uh, at times we get busy with our own lives, but like, Hey, you know, we'll call each other out like, hey, man, why don't you call me? Why don't you, you know, have that accountability call in on Sunday? Let me know how you're doing. Um, so I think the solution to it is it, it, it's network. You know, it's a small community of whether it's police and firemen and other people that, are, that have been exposed to it, first responders that are exposed to this stress constantly. You know, it's not a normal thing. And it's OK. It's OK that it's not normal. You know, like that's you chose this professional. It's honorable that you chose this profession of service to people. You know, that I, I don't think it's asking too much for for the public to, to give back and to help and to be understanding at least of that, or at least be a little bit empathetic to what you go through every day. And uh, and fortunately, there are organizations, private and, and government organizations that are there to help and support, you know, these people. Um, the VA has been doing a pretty good job lately. You know, they, they've they've definitely stepped up their game. Um, and, you know, the Green Bay Foundation has been really good. Um, the Til, Til Valhalla uh, project, the guys that do all this stuff, they, they've been very good and they, they bring a, a lot of exposure. And um, I think that's what it is. I think it's just bringing it to the forefront and, and letting people know that and letting people know that, hey, it's not, it's not an act of cowardice to come forward and ask for help. It's, it's actually a sign of strength. I think it's interesting because you said in there that you think that stigma is starting to go away, that stigma that used to be in there it's uh, going away that, that you're not okay. Cause I, th I think that you're very right. That's what a lot of people do. Like, Oh, if I say something, they're going to pull me. They're going to, they're going to put me in the back seat. They're going to do something. It's nice to hear that you think that that stigma is going away. I think so. I think it's, it's an exposure. And, and as I was trying to get out when I was, as I was getting out of seventh group, um, and I'll still advocate for it is like once these guys come back from deployments, they need to get a cycle of going through the invisible wound center, getting themselves checked. Hey, go talk to a site, go talk to this, not just, Hey, let me check the box because I want to, you know, I want to my R3 and I want to get out and go on a, you know, I go and leave. Like I'm just going to check the box and go on leave. And I'm not going to talk about how I'm really doing. And then that, that 60 day, 90 day follow up. Hey, let's go back in there and see how they're doing now. How are they readjusting back to, to life at home? How's family life? You know? How are you and your wife getting along? How are you and your kids getting along? Why are you not talking to anybody? You know, why don't you reach out to your family kind of deal? And if you don't hold those guys accountable, you know, if you call guys out, especially in this community, and you know, so you call guys out like, all right, you call me out on it. All right, I got to I gotta come forward and like, yeah, this is what's, what's going on. Because if you don't, they're not going to call themselves out. Guys don't want to expose themselves and they don't want to make themselves vulnerable because they still do, whether it's a stigma or not they still do um, think that that is out there. Hey, you're going to be put in the back seat, or, Hey, you're going to be off the team and you're going to go to the B team and you're going to have a little, little R and R and go talk to the psych, you know? Um, so they're going to send you to go talk to the wizard. And once you talk to the wizard, like you're not, you know, you're not operational anymore. That's, that's not, that's not the way it is anymore. It, it really isn't. Um, and guys need to know that and leadership, it starts with leadership. Leadership has to um, make that culture, an awareness of that culture saying, Hey man, we know that this is what happens. You know, we get bumps and bruises. Doesn't mean we're broken. You know, we just like an injury, anything like a, like a broken arm, a rolled ankle, a knee injury. You got to go in there and got, you got to get treatment for it, you know, get that treatment for it. And once you're good, Hey, we could, we could get you back out there. It's these things can be healed kind of deal. And you could, you could have some maintenance on it, you know, but you have to go in there and you have to, you have to address the problem. You know, we need to know what's going on. We just let's, hey, let's let's clean all the system out and, you know, let, let's get the best operator that we can get here instead of, hey, we got these guys bumps and bruises and skeletons in their closet. And, you know, everything if everything ain't right at home, everything ain't going to be right in the battlefield. You know, you're going to have that stressor that's going on. So you don't need that. Um, so an operational standpoint, these guys 
you know, I think that that gets encouraged by leadership to, to get these guys back in the fight, but also as a, as a personal standpoint too, and a responsibility of leadership, they need to know like, Hey, this guy, he's done all I can do for us. And it's time for him to, you know, get that help and let's, let's help him, whether he's going to be on the team or not be on the team, let's take care of our guys. And I've been fortunate enough to be around guys that, that sincerely do care and that they will take care of the guys. Even when their guys are gone, they're still following up. They're still checking up. And I think that's, that's, that's a credit to, to our brotherhood. And I think a credit to the, at least the, the team and leadership that I had, but it starts with leadership and starts with that, that culture of, Hey, it's okay to come forward. You know, you don't have to talk about your feelings 24 seven, but let's, let's address what's going on. You know, I think it's funny whenever you say, you know, you're talking about it and what we've talked about this whole conversation that we've had is accountability. We need more accountability in the world you say that when you go to the teams, it's all about accountability. And it's, it's, it sounds crazy to me, and I'm sure it sounds crazy to you too. The thing that's going to keep these guys alive, which is the accountability of saying there's something wrong, that's the yep. one, and that's in what we've said all night. That's in law enforcement, that's in first responders, that's in military, that's in special forces. The one thing to be accountable for that, that is going to keep them going is the one thing that we shirk the most. Yeah. Um, you know, for sure. I think it's, you know, if, if you're not right in the head and if things aren't, if things aren't, you know, squared away, if you're not squared away, it's, it's, it's your, your TTPs, you know, your PCIs, PCCs, it's, it's seeing everything before you go on that mission. It's like doing everything and making sure every, all your ducks are in a row. Um, and it's also having that self-awareness like, Hey, what's my weakness right now? Maybe my weakness is that, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a little banged up, you know, that there's something that's not right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting things or, Hey, I get angry real quick. I have this. And you see that trend and either you need to self identify it or that guy who's closest to you because you've, you've built that relationship with these guys you work with as a family over a period of time, they need to identify that and they need to know that they're not hurting you by by exposing you and making you get help and pulling you you know pulling you from from the team for from a limited time they're helping you they're helping you they're helping their family you know they're helping your kids etc and long term is like hey man you're a great operator you did everything great for us but like you don't need to keep doing this like your your job the most important job is for you to go home to your kids you go home to your family you to take care of this and at, th at some point you become a liability if you can't self-identify yourself and what your weakness is you're going to hurt other people and you get other people killed. And, and, and if you if you have that accountability, there's a culture of accountability, you know, that, you know, that, Hey, I'm not being weak here, but I know that, Hey, I need to take a step back, either get my shit straight and get myself back up to that level. I was, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, you know, whatever it may be, um, get your, get your ducks in a row before you could be at that level. And if you, if you, if you don't get people where they're always operating at that level and you're just like, hey, you know what, let it drop, you know, again, like we're talking about standards, you can't have that lower standard because if everybody's operating at that 95% and you're, you're that guy that's holding everybody back the whole time, whether it's, you know, you know, uh, emotionally, you got other stuff going on physically, et cetera, you got, a, you got this injury that you're just not dealing with, but hey, you're the guy that everybody's got to wait for on the run or hey, got to carry your shit because you can't carry your own ruck, you know, there's an issue. So just like that, it, it's like, Hey, self-identify yourself, take a little bit of time to get yourself better. And, and your teammates need to identify that as well. And leadership needs to identify that as well. And sometimes because we are stubborn and we are ignorant and we, a lot of us are very pig headed because the way we are, we're not going to say, yeah, I'm taking, I'm going to sit out this one until someone literally physically grabs us and says, Hey, you're out of this one. You know, sit this in and out. And, and that's what needs to happen sometimes. Speaking of that, I think that's a perfect segue into Mission Six Zero. Um, you said that this was important that we talk about this, so I, I want to kind of just give the floor to you. I don't want to lead the questions in any way. Uh, I might have things that pop up every once in a while, but I really want you to talk about this. Yeah, um, I got involved with these guys as I was getting out um, with Jason. Um, so Jason Van Camp is a best-selling author. Um, he uh, wrote a book, Deliberate Discomfort, um, yeah, West Point grad, 10th Special Forces guy, played football too at West Point. Um, great dude. So I've been working with them a little bit. And 
the basically the whole thing too is with mission six zero is is getting people out of that comfort zone some of it's corporate some is with teams nfl teams major league baseball teams college football teams etc um but in, but in general society they just started a, a deliberate discomfort um uh you know 60 day challenge where they get these people these ordinary people are going on these challenges and they're pushing themselves to these limits knowing that hey we need to start getting ourselves comfortable being uncomfortable you know whether it's talking about you know certain things that we talked about in the beginning you know something that's uncomfortable an uncomfortable uh conversation whether it's racial between the racial lines or whatever it may be um we need to come to the forefront and have a conversation sometimes and sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. Just get used to that. Sometimes in life, in order to get to a comfortable stage, you have to go through some uncomfortability at first. You have to be uncomfortable. You know, you know, you're going to sit there in the rain and and cold and everything else, and it sucks. But you're not going to appreciate that sunny day until you go through that rainy, shitty day. You know, and uh, so that's what 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 Jason has has really been doing with uh, with Mission Six Zero, and I've I've been you know, privileged to come on board with these guys. Um, Nate Boyer is one of the guys that was on there too. Um, uh, great story with him. They're, they're, they have a whole list of guys you can look up on Mission Six Zero. Um, great speakers and um, just just the great thing they've been doing. And then um, Warrior Rising is also a foundation that he has that they help guys with veterans that are getting out to become entrepreneurs, kind of, you know, helping them, assisting, hey, developing a business plan, doing all this stuff um, that's going to help you know, guys be successful and taking that same mindset that we had in the military and that discipline and the stuff that we were taught there and translating that to the civilian side. And I think that's something that, you know, employers and businesses will look and say, hey, this is really the characteristics and the, and the quality of people we want to hire because there is a lot to, to say, hey, these guys have discipline. These guys have, you know, self-initiative. They have accountability. And as crazy as it is to say that it's a rare commodity now in society as a whole, you know, so it's easy yep. for them to pick out and go, Hey, this guy became a top 1% of the, you know, uh, of the military for a reason, you know, so what's to say you can't do that in the corporate side. So, so they're doing a lot of that, like grooming these guys to come out and to, uh, to get these jobs in, in the civilian sector and also start their own businesses. So, um, he's doing great things there. It's a great organization. Um, they have, a, a great business plan and also a great the deliberate discomfort thing it, it speaks for itself you know is is getting ourselves back to a society where hey we have to go through a little bit of uh, discomfort in order to get to to that comfortability and uh i mean i'm, I'm all about it and I, I think it's great what he's doing and uh i think there's going to be continued success in the future with it what was it about that organization because there's there's a ton of them you know, yeah. that are, that are trying to, to kind of turn it around. Like you said, veterans and all that kind of stuff. What was it about mission six zero that, that you said, yep, that's the one. I think it's sort of, uh, just in the conversation, I think a big part of what we do, especially as green berets is build rapport, right? So it's, it's be able to read people, be able to hey, talk to people first, you know, before we ask them for something, what can we give them first? Right. What can we give you? you know, before you give us something back, you know, without us asking for you to give us something back by, with, and through, right? Um, so with Jason, it was easy. It was just having that conversation with him, um, talking to him, building a little bit of rapport, seeing where he came from, similar background, um, coming from special operations, you know, uh, athletic background prior to that, um, seeing where I saw the lack was is that, Hey, you know, you got to have a little more grit. Maybe we lack a little bit out in society that let's, let's push the envelope a little bit here in order to get people, you know, the general public can also experience like what, what it is like to be uncomfortable, you know? And, uh, I think we're on the same page as far as, uh, like that. And I think I already started writing some articles and, and some blogs or something and he actually had picked it up and it's like, yeah, you're, I, I think it was even in my, my resume was something that said, you know, uh, being uncomfortable, being comfortable in uncomfortable situations, you know, something like that, you know? And, uh, so, so it, it hit a note with him and we, we kicked, we hit it off pretty well. And, um, I just think the whole, the principle of what they're, what they're professing, um, was in line with like what I thought as far as my values. Speaking of mission six zero and veterans, 
let's talk about the future of uh, Patrick Collins here because I think this is it and it's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, Delta Fuego. Yep. First, I want you to tell the story of how you came up with the idea for uh, good whiskey, good coffee, and uh, good friends. Uh, I want you to tell that story. But then I want to talk about this company because it is multifaceted in so many different ways. Uh, there's things that haven't come up um, that we have talked about. And if you want to talk about those that are on the horizon for this company, there's a clothing line. There's a coffee there's so many different things that this company does. Uh, let's talk about it because it's a super exciting company, and I'm I I, I got a hundred percent support behind it. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So the 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 whiskey friends and uh, coffee kind of, I think it comes from the same thing as just sitting around uh, team room, having coffee, having a little whiskey, talking shit. Um, just talking story with each other about things, uh, our experiences and where, where it's brought us. I was fortunate enough to be in seventh group. Um, it brought me down to Central America and a lot of these other guys go down to South America, um, which isn't a bad AO to have, you know, uh, in comparison to some of the other ones. But went down to Guatemala, um, you know, story of most seventh group guys, you know, fell in love with a beautiful Latina. Um, <laughs> you know, sort of my long hair dictionary. And, uh, so, so that story, you know, played out itself. Um, I'm still, still with the, the same person, just, you know, the struggle continues, as I say, you know, four years later. Um, but, uh, but I also fell in love with the culture. I fell in love with the, the, the people down there, the way of life. Um, the, the coffee is great, you know, in Guatemala, Antigua, especially. And so it was one of those things like, hey, man, that's a great place to be. Um, and started putting roots down there, actually. So and, and still am as we speak. I think I'm, I'm moving more towards Guatemala is going to be my home base with this company and uh, doing like everybody else is the exodus out of California. Uh, it's just too damn expensive. And, you know, I, I got to hide my guns, you know, if I had guns allegedly right. um, <laughs> allegedly right. um, we we can we can tone that out yeah 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 so i mean um it's just it's just a great place to be you know i just came back from there um and it, it's just a way of life it, it, it's great uh it's like a time lapse back to like the 1950s you know the, the good parts of the 50s in the states you know people are nice people say hello to you um it's good. I have, I have a good, good friends down there. Uh, a lot of good networks. I'm, I'm currently still working down there in, in some aspects. Uh, and, uh, the coffee and, and just the climate there is perfect. It's eternal spring. You know, it's, they always say it's like eternal primavera. So it's, it's perfect weather. You know, it's right around high seventies, low eighties every day. You can't beat it. Um, beautiful climate. Um, great people. And I just fell in love with it. So I decided, hey, why not, you know, start a coffee business? Everybody else is starting this coffee business. You know, let's put the <laughs> cart in front of the horse, you know, kind of deal. And I did. I launched the coffee. I think I launched the coffee business without having coffee. So um, that may be a first in all the history. Um, before I had my product, I was like, hey, let me start a coffee pro co company. Let me get my apparel out there. Um, let me get my branding. Oh, yeah, I need coffee. Uh, so <laughs> I just went back down on my trip and, um, the volcano was erupting for 60 days straight. So that, that held up some airlines and some other stuff, but, uh, I was able to, to go visit, um, a couple of the, the, the farms and also a couple of the little fincas and, uh, where we source and coffee from. And so going forward, you know, I should have an inventory, uh, coming up in this next month. I'm going back down actually on Sunday. Um, and I'll be able to finalize some of these deals and then get some product up here and be ready for distribution. Um, I'm hoping by May 15th. <clears throat> wow. So, that's pretty quick. I mean, for yeah. going back down there, that's, that's a pretty fast, Let, let's talk about the coffee for a minute. Um, like you said, everyone has started a coffee company, um, yeah. but there's always room for more because coffee is so, to me, coffee is so different from every single one that you go to. The beans come from yeah. different places. They roast them different. They, they do things. So what makes your coffee stand out? I think the story behind it, Hey, you know, like 
just like Black Rifle is, you know, hey, this is the idea that was conception during combat or conception during, you know, just sitting around, hey, man, I want a better life. I don't want to do all, do all this crap anymore. And uh, I think the story behind it, but also the area that I'm sourcing it from in Antigua and Guatemala is it's one of the richest in the world. Um, the soil is great. It's the perfect climate. Um, we'll have whole bean uh, also roasted as you know, as they want to, to roast it, there's the different varietal that we could have. Um, but in, in the, in the inception is going to be, you know, whole bean that we're coming from that, that, that region. And that region's always been rich. Um, a lot of the other companies, uh, you know, big, big box companies, Starbucks, et cetera, come from some of those regions or outside of it. But the ones that we're sourcing from is giving back to the community. Um, it's all local, uh, family farms, family fincas, and you know they'll give back to the local economy and also what makes ours difference is um we're going to donate um 10 of our profits uh, are going to be donated to the green Bay foundation um so so that's i think what separates us from a lot of these other companies where they say we want to give back you know initially every you know you know 10 and of all the profits that we make here are going to be donated back to the green Bay foundation and then further on you know hopefully in a situation financially as we grow um, can give back a little bit more than that. <clears throat> can we talk about the whiskey real quick? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, and I want to go back to the, you know what, let's hold the whiskey for a second. Okay. What are we looking at for price points on, on the coffee? Um, right now we're still, we're still, uh, talking about that as far as like what the market is right now. But I mean, we're going to be, we're going to be at market value just along with, uh, cause it's a smaller, smaller company. We don't have the big box name right now. We don't have the, the huge inventory. So we're looking around the same, uh, same price lines as, uh, as black rifle coffee right now. And those, those guys, so it's smaller boutique coffee, um, is what we're looking at. So we still have to do a little research on some of it, but, um, we're going to keep it around, you know, in comparison, basically competitive with the, the boutique coffee company that's out there. Okay. All right, let's go into the whiskey for a minute because this is the yeah. one I'm pretty excited about too. Um, I love a good whiskey. Uh, that one's a little further down the road, but there are big plans with yeah. it. There is. Um, right now, the initial investment is with, uh, it's called uh, uh, Dublin Liberties. It was the old Bushmills uh, master brewer was over there. So he started his own, came, came across that, and it was an uh, opportunity to invest in uh, Irish whiskey. So I invested in a pallet of that. So it takes three years for a whiskey to become an Irish whiskey. So it has three years. It's a bonded warehouse. I have the pallet. Um, and then it's a matter of, you know, the investments, basically a 12% return per year. And after that, about that third or fourth year, it goes up exponentially, um, especially to the eight year mark where, I mean, it's a great investment to invest in whiskey right now. Um, there's actually a company called Whiskey and Wealth um, that you can go on and, and look at. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to be introduced to this guy, Martin Bates, who's uh, one of the brokers over there. Great relationship, great uh, response, great people that they, they, they treat you like family. They stay on top. They let you know where everything's going. You know, hey, this is the investment. This is, this is where we're at. We're going to come over here. We're going to fly you over to Ireland, kind of look at your stuff. You can see where your stuff is bonded in the warehouse. Um, but after that three years, my plan is to um, actually have my own brand. And I'm not going to release the name of it yet, but it's going to be unique and uh, probably going to keep one of those barrels off to the side, keep it to go a little bit longer, probably uh, as a gift to my kids, um, probably later on down the line. And as, as it ages, like anything else, it goes up in value. Um, so it's a good investment to have. I'm looking forward to the three year once right around that, that two year mark, we'll probably start a, a pretty big marketing for it. Um, again, throwing the, uh, the cart in front of the horse kind of deal, uh, just before it's, it's ready to launch, but, uh, I'm excited about it. And, and it's just the, the first, the first step. And as I gain capital, I want, I want to invest a little bit more in it too. I think it's a good, a good way to, um, to spend my money, I guess. And, uh, it's a good investment. It actually is a good investment. If you look into it, it's uh, whiskey and wealth and, uh, uh, the returns are pretty good. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon. It's been around forever. And the Irish whiskeys, uh, it's been like a 900% markup, uh, especially since COVID. Um, and it, it's, it's one of the highest, hottest brands and products. You look at Conor McGregor has his own launch with, you know, uh, was it 
again, 12. I don't even remember what his, his whiskey is. All I know is that it gave me the worst hangover ever. Um, <laughs> it, it, it tasted pretty good going down, but it gave me a bad hangover. Um, but I, I think I, I think you would agree. That's Irish whiskey because I love the taste of Irish whiskey too. But yeah, it, it's always got a roundhouse waiting for you in the morning. It does. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Jameson guy, you know, and I, I could, at this point I could sip on it, you know, I could do my, my Jameson and gingers kind of deal. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, that, that proper 12, it, it felt like Conor McGregor beat the shit out of me the night before when I woke up. Um, it was pretty bad. Maybe that was his cart in front of the horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when he decided to do that, he said, this is what we want. We want them to feel like they spent a night with yeah, me. Exactly. Um, but it tastes good going down, so I can't complain. But uh, I'm excited, excited about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the clothing line, uh, you see it right there. That's the flag from the from the website. Uh, yeah, got t-shirts, got your, hoodies, uh, hats. I do. I got the hats. I got a. Uh, I got your shirt right here. Oh right yeah. Here. I got your uh, your Kelly Green. There you go. There you that's, go. That's Both awesome. Beans. Uh, you want to, uh, you want to talk about that for a minute, how you came up with that logo? Um, yeah, I, uh, it's a, it's just pouring coffee over, over a guy's head. Um, uh, so a friend of mine, 10th group, a really good friend of mine, uh, he sent me that picture in the caricature. He had an outline. So I was like, yeah, I want to use this. Um, is that considered and, a pour over? Yeah, it's a pour over. Okay. Yeah, it's a pour over. Uh, it's a boutique pour over. It's okay. very unique. Okay. Um, so I came up with that, but also the, the logo itself. So, so this, I came up and it, it was all, it was all branded. It's sort of, um, in line with, uh, what am I trying to do here? There we go. Sort of in line with, uh, and you see it on the screen, our team, we had, uh, the hooligans. So we had, you know, the brass knuckles was a big part of our thing. Um, so the brass knuckles, the arrows crossing for special forces, the old Indian, um, the, the inception where it came from the grenades. Um, and just the skull, it just it just looked like a cool logo, uh, Delta Fuego itself, um, with the T-shirt brands. I want to launch that. Um, there's some different ones that are out there. If you look at the website, I'm, I'm revamping the website. I just talked to a, a website company and a marketing uh, company that's going to actually launch that probably the same time frame, uh, mid May June. Um, have a big marketing. Uh, videos, et cetera, social media going forward. So I think we're going to use uh, Diesel Jack Media that Mission 60 uses and also uh, Ranger Up used to use and uh, Black Rifle use. So we're going to use those guys or have their services to to help us uh, expand the product, expand the brand. Um, Delta Fuego came from, I thought it was unique, you know, Delta being a 18 Delta. Um, Fuego is a little Latin flair to it too. And uh, there's, there's a little bit more of a story behind that too, but uh um, that can be, it's a great, time. it's a great logo. <laughs> and, uh, I haven't had any complaints about it. The grenades, I threw the grenades in there. You know, we, the last, uh, deployment was in a room and a couple, a couple grenades went off, uh, pretty close to me. I think the, the mule that was in the room got the worst of it, but I just got a little bit of my, my shoulder and my plate carrier. Thank God. Um, and so I, I just threw those in there. I, I think it's a pretty cool logo. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think big things ahead with it. So I think we're settled on it. I don't think we're going to change it very much. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll just have we'll have different T-shirts, different lines of stuff going forward. We've just got a we got a pretty creative uh, couple guys and artists that that are on board. So they'll 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 be the ones pumping out the product and pumping up the ideas and more uh, more of these boutique pour overs. <laughs> I like it. One final question for you. Toughest fight of your life, baseball, MMA, special forces, or being an entrepreneur? Ooh, uh, it's too early for me to tell you with the entrepreneur stuff, but I'll tell you this last week has been sort of a kick in the balls. Um, I feel well, like yeah, I mean, you and I were talking, you're like, yeah, I'll be back at this time. Then you're like, nope, not going to happen. Yeah. And I'm, I'm getting ready to leave in, in, in two days and three days. And maybe I go back in country. They may shut it down. I could do my COVID. I mean, it's, the COVID thing is throwing a wrench into it a little bit, but yeah. I mean, the, the beauty is that like, like I've, I've done well during COVID. I, I'm, I feel for those who haven't and have, have, you know, suffered a little financially, especially emotionally, family, et cetera, being away. But, um, 
I, I found, you know, a way around it. And I think just being resilient, I think the SF background that that sort of helped out and, and, and being able to navigate different channels. Um, hardest one, I'd say they all, they all have their own baseball. It's, it's a game of failure, right? So I think baseball prepared me for special operations. I think it prepared me for life a little bit too. Um, MMA to me was fun. Um, you know, you got to, you got to basically have a street fight, get paid for it and not get locked up at the end of the day. So couldn't really complain about it. I had fun doing it. Um, and it, it, it also was, it was useful going into special operations where you're able to use this on the guise of, uh, you know, and the flag of the United States government, you know, it was sanctioned. Um, so, but I think SF to me was, probably the hardest. I think the entrepreneur stuff for me now, I appreciate it more. And it's for me, it's freedom to do what I want to do because, uh, you know, so I can't complain because I knew what the discomfort was in special operations. I knew what this discomfort was prior with failures. So for me, everything ahead, you know, I look at it as, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm on borrow time, you know, like I, I've, I've, there's, there's instances where I shouldn't be alive. I'm alive. I know guys that aren't, um, I, on my wrist for Andy from Marcosano and it's always a reminder hey you know it's it's never gonna get that bad don't let the value win kind of deal and you I have a responsibility to people to uphold that and to live a full life going forward for those guys who sacrificed on my behalf and everybody else's behalf um so special forces I think one of the missions was probably the worst um I remember a nine hour hump that we got up to the top of the mountain and uh it was there was no getting around it. If we didn't get up there in time, the other guys that were coming through would, would have been screwed. So like we, we got there nine hours. I think we travel, I think 6,000 feet. Um, I probably was carrying about 120 pounds, you know, um, and it sucked, but we got to the top. That was probably one of the shittiest, shittiest missions we had, but it also, all that suffering, all that pain, all that, that, that stuff we had in training prep me for that where, Hey, you can't quit here. Like, I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. I know my body can do it and I'll fail when I get to the top, you know, or I'll fail on my way down or I'll, I'll quit, you know, when the sun comes up, but there is no quitting at that point. So that was the hardest for me, I think. Um, but I think all the other stuff prepared me for that. And that was sort of the pinnacle of, Hey, this is success because of all the hardships I had gone through before. I know that this is only going to last for a small amount of time. All this pain is going to go away eventually. Um, hopefully, you know, get back down the mountain, have a beer and, you know, let's do it again. So this new chapter of my life, I'm super excited for, um, you know, I, I have that freedom now. I, I hopefully I earned a little bit of that freedom. I fought for a little bit of that freedom. And I, I feel like, you know, it's a little bit sweeter for me now because of the shit that I went through prior. I think that now I, I, I feel like I've earned it a little bit. I don't feel entitled, but I feel like, Hey, I've earned a little bit. So I could, uh, I said, I could cut back and give myself a little slack and, you know, actually enjoy this part of my life. Where can everybody find you? Let's go through. Cause there's a couple different places they can find. You. <laughs> um, Delta Fuego, uh, dot com. We'll, we'll have the website. It's already up there running, but it gets an idea of, uh, what we have going on. Um, uh, Delta Fuego Instagram, um, and then uh, Mission Six Zero. Uh, you can find me on there too, and, and with Jason, the mission that we have going on with them. Uh, and then also, I, I tell guys, you know, visit visit the website, visit uh, you know, go to the Green Beret Foundation. There's some links there too to, to actually to, to help out Andy Marcusano that, that fund and that that foundation they started uh, through the Green Beret Foundation. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can find me there. And, and if you guys do, you know, drop me, you know, you know drop me a message. You know, I'll, I'll usually respond within, you know, 24 hours or so. It depends if I'm on the road or if I'm somewhere where I don't have cell phone service. Um, I'll get back to them. But but yeah, hit me up. And and hopefully, you know, within these next uh, couple of weeks, I have this this thing up and going. The wheels are turning. The 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 horse is in front of the cart at some point. And uh <laughs> We'll, we'll get this in the right direction, but I mean, good things forward and it's always moving forward, you know, whether it's small, small steps, but it's just always moving forward. And, uh, I really appreciate the time that you, uh, you took to, to, to bring some light to some of this stuff, especially the, you know, the veteran suicide and, and some of that stuff. And, uh, I really appreciate the time and it's an honor, you know, being on this podcast. 
podcast probably coming forward too. If you look at the website, I'm trying to get that. I got all my equipment is just about uh, all in. I just got to set it all up. So you could probably help me out with that. Some Absolutely. Of those questions I'll be bouncing off of you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Guys, uh, make sure you check it out. Deltafuego.com. Already there's t-shirts, hats, hoodies, things like that on there. Soon to come, there will be coffee uh, about mid-May. And then in a couple years, we've got whiskey coming down the line. You can also go to mission60.com. Check that out. Look at the uh, Green Beret Foundation. There's a lot of different places you can find this. Uh, he even still does some training. I'll make sure that I put a link for that, too, that you still do some training um, here and uh, in Guatemala. Uh, you can, you can be found in a ton of different places. And, and I would suggest going to his stuff cause he's got some very cool pictures from some very cool places on there. Take a look around, drop him a message. That's going to be it for us tonight. If you want more of me, you can go to Twitter, double speak DJ. You can go to Facebook group at the DTD podcast, and you can go on YouTube and watch all of these video conversations there at the DTD podcast page. That's going to be it. That's Patrick. I'm DJ. This has been the show. We'll catch you on the next one, guys. We'll see you later. Appreciate it.